Layer 2 blockchains have now reached over $20 billion in total value locked. In this video, we're going to talk about one of the most crucial components of any L2 chain, the sequencer. We'll first talk about the actual role of a sequencer in a Layer 2 blockchain and then move into the different kinds of sequences that exist today. To start us off, we're going to talk about centralized sequences, which is what most L2 chains operate today. And then we'll branch out into the kind of different solutions that are being built to solve the issues that arise from having centralized control of a sequencer. In particular, we're going to talk about decentralized sequences, shared sequences, and we'll finally move into something that was announced just a couple of days ago, which was Polygon's Ag Layer. So without further ado, let's get right into the details. So you love the slides in the last video. That video is performing very well. So we're bringing back the slides again for this episode. This time we've titled it the Ag Layer, which is kind of what we're going to lead into with all of the context of how else to operate today with the centralized sequences, the couple of different options and solutions that are being built to address this and the pros and cons of each. And then we'll finally talk about what the ag layer is and what it will become over time, which is uh, a new kind of announcement that came out from Polygon yesterday as I'm recording this video. But by the time I post it, it'll probably be a couple of days ago. If you want to check out the announcement tweet, that will probably, if I remember, be linked in the description below as well. So let's get this started. So what we're going to be talking about today is we're first going to talk about, as we mentioned, what the actual role of a sequencer is. We'll then move into centralized sequences, decentralized sequences, shared sequences, and then finally we'll wrap it up with the polygon ag layer and move into some final thoughts on this whole topic as well. As always, the slides, if you want to uh, download them, they'll be linked in the description from an IPFS link. If the link looks a little sketchy, that's just uh, how the IPFS links look. I'm not going to uh, post a virus or anything down there, but as always, do it at your own risk. So let's actually talk about what the sequences are. So what is the purpose of a sequencer? And if you've watched my Polygon ZK EVM video, you will already know the answer to this, but the sequencer plays arguably the two most important roles in the layer two blockchain. And the two roles that I'm talking about are firstly, the sequencer is responsible for actually either executing or discarding all of the transactions that get sent to the layer two. So imagine you're sending uh, a swap or a trade or whatever transactions you're uh, performing on the layer two blockchain. Those go into the mempool of that L2. And the sequencer is basically firstly responsible to say, hey, I'm gonna constantly keep looking at the mempool for new transactions. And it basically uh, gathers them all together and says for each one, it runs a couple of checks. So it says things like, hey, is this actually a valid transaction? Is this a duplicate transaction? Do you have enough funds to execute this transaction? Uh, does this clash with another transaction? Things like that, just to make sure it's actually going to be uh, valid according to the rules of the chain. And then based on those checks, it either decides to execute it or discard it, and then broadcasts that information to the other nodes uh, on that network, which then feeds back to any users or decentralized applications that are reading the data of the L2. So uh, the summary of the first responsibility there is basically picks up the transactions from the mempool and executes them. So the sequencer is the one responsible for actually doing all of the handling of the transactions on the L2. So it's a very crucial responsibility that it holds. The second very important, uh, arguably even more important in some aspects responsibility that it has is actually sending the uh, transaction data of the transactions that it executes into the rollup contract on Ethereum in the form of batches. So essentially after it executes these transactions, it's going to say, hey, I want to, you know, do what these L2s are promising and inherit the security and, and decentralization of Ethereum. In order to do that, I'm going to provide all of the transaction data that I know about back to Ethereum. And I'm going to make that more optimized by batching them and, and in some cases, uh, compressing those batches as well to save space. And um, I won't get into it in this video, but hopefully another video will make soon about uh, 4844 and, and further optimizations to this process as well. But the sequencer is a very crucial uh, party or component of any L2 as it's responsible for executing all the transactions and then also sending all that transaction data back to Ethereum as well. So here, I've just summarized that on this slide. So rule number one, execute the transactions and rule number two is to actually batch them. So today, the issue that we're kind of um, foreshadowing in this little presentation here is that 
there's multiple rollups, right? In this slide, you can imagine I've tried to create this like infinite uh, image where, you know, there's multiple rollups doing the exact same thing. So you can imagine there's Polygon ZK EVM, there's Optimism, there's Base, there's Arbitrum, there's Scroll, there's Tyco, all of the ZK EVMs that we covered in uh, our ZK EVM video on my channel as well. They're pretty much all doing the same thing, right? They all run their own sequencer and they all run their own rollup contract. And they're doing this independently of one another. So so Polygon ZAVM is running its own sequencer, Optimism is running its own sequencer, so on and so forth. And none of these L2s really have any capability outside of some services that I'm not too familiar with, to be honest, like um, Chainlink, for example, or maybe Hyperlane, for example, some of these um, cross-chain interaction services. But uh, at, at really, uh, you know, a protocol level or uh, a level that these L2s all agree on. There's no opt-in behavior to say, hey, I want to have interoperability from my L2 to another L2 to another L2 and access the users and the liquidity and, and community members of each of these L2 chains, right? They're all kind of siloed ecosystems. So when I um, did in my ZK EVM video, right, to deploy a smart contract on the ZK Sync era ZK EVM, I had to bridge funds, go through the bridge, um, and then once I bridged funds across, there's no utility for me for the funds and the, the liquidity that I brought across to that chain to be able to use it on any of the other L2s, even though they're pretty much all doing uh, the same thing in a lot of cases. So I can't use those funds on Polygon ZKVM. I can't use it on Optimism unless I bridge back to Ethereum and then go through another bridge, um, which is a pain and it's also expensive in some cases. So that's the real issue that we're kind of foreshadowing into today. Um, we're going to talk about centralized sequences first, and then we'll move into um, some of the solutions to this issue. So yeah, like I said, there's no interoperability between any of these big names like Tyco, Polygon, Optimism, Base, and that's, that's really an issue for users where you, it's an issue for users and developers both, because users, you're kind of picking a community, right? You pick and have some loyalty to these chains where you say, okay, I like this application on this chain or, or I have some uh, affinity to this chain and I have my funds over there, but I can't access any of these other L2 chains. And for developers, it's the same perspective, right? It's like, well, I could deploy my chain onto Optimism, for example, and access, you know, I, I think maybe the base community is cool. I could deploy onto the base community and do like the on-chain summer community type things. None of the other uh, communities or people within Web3 that aren't on those chains can access the experiences that I'm building unless I go ahead and redeploy uh, the contracts that I'm creating onto each of these um, layer twos independently and then have to, you know, jank my application together to support like 20 different chains. The point is, it's it's a bit of a pain. And, and despite most of these L2s operating a lot of the same technologies in the same way and supporting the same standards, there's no interoperability between any of them. So what we're going to talk about first is the centralized sequencer. So all of these big names that I have on the screen uh, right now, I believe you can check this on l2beat.com as well for yourself, are operating a centralized sequencer. So this screenshot in the middle is from L2Beat from uh, Arbitrum's page. You'll find the same thing on pretty much any, uh, you know, household name, uh, uh, probably not household name, but, you know, popular L2 today that they're operating what's called a centralized sequencer. What does that actually mean? So what is centralized, right? Is centralized bad? You know, centralized in my mind has very negative connotations. What does it actually mean? So centralized essentially means that a single instance of that sequencer is being run and likely it's being maintained uh, and, and kind of controlled by the core devs of the protocol that are running the L2. So for example, um, in Optimism's case, the you know the Optimism team is probably running the uh, L2 and, and maintaining the performance and the upgrades or, or whatever is necessary to maintain that uh, L2 is actually operating as expected and, and the same goes for any of these companies as well, right? I don't wanna you know point out specific names. I'm not going to pretend that I know what's going on behind the scenes at all of these companies, but that's just a, a kind of broad generalization is that likely the, the team behind the L2 is running a centralized sequencer. Imagine in your mind that essentially uh, a single instance running this specific sequencer software that is picking up the transactions and also sending them to the Ethereum L1. So 
I kind of mentioned so the word centralized, especially in Web3, has pretty negative connotations, right? So centralized usually just means um, when you say that word, it's, oh, centralized is bad, which in some respects, you know, the whole point of what we're building is to be decentralized. So that is, uh, you know, a valid point. But centralized sequences, um, as we'll kind of get into, they offer the best performance for the actual L2s. And when you're talking about L2s, what most users care about is the scalability and the performance of the chain, right? When you hear people talk about L2s, you say, oh, the transactions went through so efficiently or so quickly. You know, I, I felt like I was using a Web2 application where the transactions went through in a couple of seconds or, or, you know, three to five seconds, right? And the finality of those transactions go through almost instantly for the users, um, which is a nice change coming from Ethereum or, or some other uh, chains where, you know, it can take a couple of minutes to even have your transaction go through and you're kind of standing there waiting for it to happen. So in the context of L2s, it's important to actually uh, value that performance for users. But how does it actually achieve that improved performance? The question here is kind of self-explanatory for me is like, well, if I don't have to worry about any of the decentralization aspects, all of the complexity that comes along with maining, maintaining a decentralized system, like incentivizing people to do the right thing and, and punishing people to do the wrong thing, you basically only have to care about optimizing the performance of the sequencer, right? And, and anything else is not a priority for you. So the reason it, it is consistent is because, well, you're the one basically running this piece of software that you're controlling, you're monitoring, you're able to make improvements to this over time. And the only thing that you really care about is the actual performance. The other point that I have here down the bottom is that in the case of ZK EVMs, if you've watched that uh, Polygon ZK EVM video on my channel, you know that there's a kind of second step where the batches that get sent by the sequencer, those go to a aggregator who is responsible for sending it to the prover who produces a zero knowledge proof of whether that batch was valid or not. As you can imagine, if you're the one running the sequencer, chances are you're probably going to generate valid batches, right? You're not gonna produce garbage or, or try and attack the network. The chances are you're probably producing valid batches that are going to get proven the first time they are sent to the aggregator and the prover, right? You're not going to experience in that kind of second phase of things, um, invalid batches where people are trying to attack the network or produce faulty batches or things like that. So you get a very consistent experience. And this is arguably, again, kind of leading back to that better uh, user experience where in the case of ZK AVMs, that means the users can therefore uh, extract their funds more quickly because those batches are being proved on that first time, right? So in the case of the Polygon ZK EVM, for example, it takes around an hour for you to be able to withdraw the batches of transactions with the centralized sequencer that is sending good quality batches back down to the Ethereum L1 and getting picked up by the aggregator. And that enables a faster um, withdrawal time for the users. So you get kind of the best of both worlds here. You get a uh, high performance level on the L2. And then when you want to withdraw it back to the L1, you're also getting that in a, a timely manner as well. So we've talked about the good side of centralized sequences. Now let's talk about the bad. And I, I don't have any text here, but this is essentially the worst case scenario of what can happen with a centralized sequencer. So this was from earlier this year. Uh, earlier last year, sorry, I, I actually got the wrong article in the screenshot. What I wanted to talk about was um, the Arbitrum sequencer going down during the inscriptions uh, hype cycle, which was earlier this year. So I've actually got the wrong screenshot here. That's my fault. But if you watch my inscriptions video, I talked about a little bit how uh, some chains were not able to handle the uh, inscriptions hype. And this is kind of the result of what can happen in a um, L2 that is running a centralized sequencer is, well, if you're not able to handle that on your sequencer, you only have one single instance running, then essentially the sequencer can go down. And that is really bad because the transactions are no longer going through to the uh, sequencer, right? The sequence is not picking them up from the mempool and it's not sending them back to Ethereum because it's not executing them. So it's pretty bad for this to happen to 
uh, Arbitrum. I'm not calling out Arbitrum. This could realistically happen to any L2 today that is operating a centralized sequencer. I think Arbitrum just experienced a lot of uh, inscription transactions on their L2, whereas uh, things like Polygon happened on the Polygon POS chain, which uh, is probably more suited to handle this kind of stuff at that scale. So realistically, any uh, L2s uh, sequencer could go down. That is a centralized sequencer. In the case of, you know, it, it is a single instance that if a bug occurs or something goes wrong, that is going to experience some downtime. So this is a pretty uh, good uh, case study, I guess, of what can happen in the worst case scenario for L2s. Oh, it's probably not the worst case scenario, but you know, there is a, a downtime for users and they're not able to submit transactions and those transactions are not going back to Ethereum. I believe in the case of the inscriptions uh, issue with Arbitrum, it was about 70 minutes. So, you know, about an hour of downtime, which is not the end of the world for an L2 environment. And then it was back online. The other kind of downsides that I should mention here are things like um, the MEV collection that centralized sequences have. So essentially imagine because all of this, these transactions are going to a sequencer, that sequencer therefore has all of the information of what transactions are inside of the kind of mempool that it's about to execute. It's then going to have the freedom to make those decisions of what MEV am I going to collect and what other things am I going to do with the information that I have, right? So imagine there's a very profitable transaction within the pool of transactions that are going to be executed. The sequencer could in theory say, well, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and submit a transaction and front run that profitable transaction because I'm the one that has control over what's being executed. Now, realistically is a centralized sequencer, you know, that's usually being operated by the protocol developers themselves going to do that? Probably not. It's going to probably tarnish the reputation of that chain. So I don't think that it is likely, but this is something that is possible. And, and I think today a lot of L2s are actually profiting off of the sequencer operation because they're taking the fees of all of the transactions on the L2 and then they make a, a margin off of the top from the costs of submitting those transactions to the L1. So I think there is some profitability aspect to this and that is important to keep in mind when you have a single party controlling essentially what is uh, being executed inside of a centralized sequencer. The other concern with that is censorship resistance. Imagine the chain developer doesn't want your transaction for some reason to go through. If they are in control of that sequencer, in theory, again, they can probably try to stop your transactions from going through and censor that from being executed and censor it from going back to Ethereum. Again, is that realistic? Is that in the incentive uh, for the protocol developers to actually do that? Probably not, but it is important to keep those risks in the back of your mind. All right, so that is centralized sequences. And I put this slide here, as always, it depends. Decentralization and security is not strictly better than scalability, right? A lot of users care about scalability and are willing to sacrifice in some of these two other pillars here to achieve higher levels of that scalability. One final kind of thing I wanted to mention about uh, centralized sequences is that most uh, layer two blockchains have either today or planned in the future, the capability to bypass the sequencer and do what's called a force uh, batch or a forced transaction to say, oh, for some reason, the sequencer, either, either if it's down or if I'm potentially being censored or some other reason, my transaction, I don't want it to go through the sequencer, you can actually force it down to the L1. I believe this is available on Arbitrum today and is planned to be enabled on Polygon ZK AVM. The code is already there. It just kind of needs to be switched on. So this is something to keep in mind. If something goes seriously wrong. You can often bypass it. The downside to that is you're essentially submitting a transaction to L1 and going to pay all of the fees on the L1 as well. So you don't get any of the benefits if you're forced to kind of bypass the whole L2 system that you would want. So to summarize the centralized sequencer, centralized sequencer, it is built for performance, built for performance. Keep jumbling up my words. It consistently performs its job well, right? So this is probably what a lot of L2 users care about and I think is what is um, the standard today. Again, like I said, this is being used by, by Optimism, this is being used by Base, Polygon ZK EVM, Arbitrum, um, maybe not in the future, depending on where you're watching this, but today and, and likely for the remainder of 
uh, at least the first half of 2024, this is probably going to be the most implemented type of sequencer for the reason that it provides the best UX. And that's really what most users tend to care about at the L2 level. So obviously, as the name suggests, the downsides here is that it's not decentralized and we saw the risks of having a centralized system. And some people argue the whole point of what we're building here is to be decentralized. And when you void that with such an important piece of the puzzle by being centralized, you're kind of making the whole system that we're working to build uh, pointless, which is you know, that is a fair argument for some people. The whole point of what we're doing is to be decentralized. Why is it allowed for uh, a system such as this to actually be in the hands of these uh, teams? And then the second point I had here on the downsides was that there is no interoperability and users can't perform cross L2 transactions, which is again, what we're kind of foreshadowing that we're gonna be talking about later in this video. I'm actually blocking that so you can't see it. There you go, no interoperability. All right, with that said, let's talk about decentralized sequences. So centralized sequences, as we said, they are performant, but they obviously have some risks associated with them by being centralized to reach that level of performance. So like we mentioned in the uh, kind of a first slide of the centralized section, we mentioned that decentralized uh, centralized typically is associated with being bad, which is obviously not the case. It always depends, but decentralized is good, right? We associate in the Web3 space decentralized being good. That's kind of the whole uh, ethos of why we're here. So let's talk about how decentralized sequences work now. The way that these decentralized sequences work, and I'm by no means an expert on this topic, but is essentially you tap in like you would with a decentralized blockchain, you have multiple different people running the software required to perform a specific role. In this case, you would probably have multiple people running the sequencer software and you use some kind of algorithm to randomly select or maybe randomly nominate for a period of time what one of those participants in the network is going to perform the role of the sequencer. And the benefits to this are essentially the reverse of um, centralized sequences. So I said here in the first point, essentially the pros and cons are reverse from having a centralized sequencer, right? So centralized kind of shined where it was most optimized for performance. It was performing on a consistent basis. You're going to consistently um, expect the sequencer to do its role. It's always likely to send good batches of transactions back to the L1. However, it is vulnerable to some of the security um, and centralization risks as we talked about earlier in this video. So whereas decentralized sequences kind of sacrifice that high level of scalability and performance because you're going to have a slower result when you're calling upon a decentralized network of nodes to say, hey, I want one of you to actually perform the role of the sequencer. That is likely not a machine being operated by someone from your team as well. So you have some, um, uh, what's the word here, variety, I guess, in the results that are going to happen, sometimes they're not gonna respond or sometimes they might try and produce some sketchy results as well. So the results are not going to be as performant and they're not going to be as consistent as well. The trade-off to that is that you get higher decentralization so that maybe let's say if one of the sequences that you've called upon is not responding or it's gone down, you could then maybe say, oh, okay, well, the algorithm that algorithm or the, the model that I've created, I can say then, well, you're not responding. We're going to call upon someone else to actually perform this role as well. So when the sequencer goes down, the whole network is not going to go down and you don't have that single point of failure. So there are again, always pros and cons to the decentralized uh, approach. And I'll leave a link to the description to Metis or Metis L2 blockchain, where it has this documentation of how it works specifically for its network. Because as I said, I'm no expert on the details of how this works under the hood, but you can imagine it basically, like I said, is just reversed the pros and cons of centralized sequences. So to summarize here, we've basically said, yep, the good here is, well, it's built for decentralization, right? It doesn't have a single point of failure or any of the other downsides that we talked about that centralized sequences have. However, it is not as performant. And again, just like centralized sequences, there is still no interoperability between uh, L2s, right? 
despite there being a decentralized network, or not a network, a decentralized uh, system in place to perform the role of the sequencer, there's still no interoperability between L2 chains. There's still one-to-one -one mapping from the uh, L2 chain to sequencer. There's one sequencer system that is serving one L2 chain. So both centralized sequences and decentralized sequences are kind of aligning in this fact, well, we're still having one sequencer to serve one chain. We therefore have no cross L2 interoperability. And as we talked about, this is the issue that users and developers face, right? Do I want to access the community and the liquidity of ZK Sync or Tyco or Scroll or Optimism? Or do I want to join the community and the liquidity on Polygon ZK EVM? I really, have no way of kind of uh, tapping into all of these at once in an, in an elegant way for either users or developers. So what we're going to talk about next is a solution called shared sequences with the goal in mind that we want to create and enable an experience for users where they can submit cross-chain transactions. And we'll talk about what that really looks like later. So we've revisited our whiteboard here. We're going to move into shared sequences now. So shared sequencing is kind of an evolved version of decentralized sequencing in my mind. It's basically a decentralized sequencing network that instead of serving a single L2 chain, it actually serves multiple L2 chains. So I've put here shared sequences operate a separate blockchain. So shared sequencing networks are actually kind of networks or actually chains themselves to perform the role of a decentralized sequencer for multiple rollups. And this is going to introduce some interoperability advantages here. So whereas decentralized sequences, the thing we just talked about, they still only serve one chain. Shared sequences, and it looks like I've typoed here, shared sequencers, it should say, serves multiple chains. So shared sequences, essentially TLDR, is a decentralized sequencer network often, I believe, maybe even always, it is a blockchain network itself operating the service of the decentralized sequencer for multiple chains, right? And you can imagine if multiple chains are kind of converging the um, sequence transactions into one sequencing network, you can imagine that is going to introduce some uh, interoperability advantages. And we'll talk about that in more detail in just a couple slides here. So here really is uh, a mental model of, uh, and I'll get my head out of the way, a mental model of the comparisons between decentralized and shared. So what we saw earlier was, well, one L2 has its own sequencer and it has its own rollup contract. Whereas in shared, multiple L2s are going to share the same decentralized sequencer network and they'll still have uh, their own roll-up contracts respectively on L1 as well. All right, let's move back down here. So why shared sequencing? And what does this actually mean for users to have interoperability between L2? Shared sequencing is pretty much going to enable what is called atomic transactions. So atomic transactions, which is a word that I learned about a couple of days ago. So again, no expert on this, but it means to be able to submit a set of transactions or a bundle as it's kind of more clear in my mind, a bundle of transactions. And within that bundle, you can say, well, I want transaction one to go to chain A. I want transaction two to go to chain B. Basically, you submit a set of transactions or a bundle to multiple different chains. In this case, we're talking about multiple different L2s. The very important part of that is that the atomic part of that means either all of those transactions are going to execute or none of them are going to execute. Why is that important? Imagine your a bridge. This is probably the easiest example to explain. A lot of bridges in a simplified way, they burn your funds on one chain and mint your funds on another chain. So that, imagine those are two transactions. One is burning funds, two is minting funds. If either of those transactions goes through without the other, the whole system is basically doomed, right? Because you've either lost all your money or you've just printed free money. <laughs> you've basically duplicated, you've done like a Minecraft duplicate glitch of your money on another chain. So the importance here, right? Imagine you're performing these use cases that I've kind of listed down the bottom here, performing a cross-chain transfer. Let's say uh, an amazing use case for users would be to say, well, I've got this token that I earned on a gaming chain, for example, right? I just earned these tokens for playing this game. I wanna buy an NFT or 
even transfer my tokens just to another chain where I want to access that community. Today, without shared sequences, you would have to kind of go back down to Ethereum and then back up to that chain. And often it's probably not even gonna be possible, right? It might not even work that way. Imagine a chain A and chain B share the same sequencer with a shared sequencing network. What this is going to facilitate in theory is you'll be able to perform a cross-chain transfer from L2 number one to L2 number two. That's probably a confusing way to say it. Chain A to chain B, a cross-chain transfer. Another, uh, maybe if you're a trader, this might uh, resonate better with you. What if you could perform cross-chain DEX arbitrage? So there is a difference in pricing. This is my uh, small brain understanding of arbitrage. If there's a difference in pricing on token A on chain A, and token A on chain B. What if you could submit transactions in a profitable manner to both of those chains? You really need both of those to go through in order for this to be successful, right? You can't have one of those failing and one of those going through successfully. You really need both of them to go through. That is important for a lot of use cases, especially when we're talking about transferring funds across chains. Now there is a number of other benefits to shared sequencing, and I'll leave an excellent blog post from Espresso, which is a shared sequencing network that lists through some of the uh, additional benefits here, but I wanna spend too much time on this slide. We'll probably talk about this for 10, 20 minutes. I'll leave a link if you wanna dive more. I wanted to quickly cover these atomic transactions as I feel like that's the most important benefit to shared sequencing networks. But again, that will be linked in the description. So that was why kind of yes to shared sequencing. What is the bull case for shared sequencing? Why not shared sequencing? What's the downsides to this? And to answer this question, we really need to think in the minds of an L2 chain developer. So a L2 developer probably built their L2 chain for a reason, right? And they want to maintain what we call sovereignty over the sequencer, which is one of the most critical parts of that L2 system that they've created. Sovereignty is a bit of a weird word for me personally. I kind of, I wanna say control here, but I think control again comes with a lot of negative connotations, right? But I'm gonna say control. The L2 chain developer wants to have control whether or not the sequencer is centralized or decentralized. They wanna have control of the sequencer for the L2, All right? What does that mean? In order to participate in the shared sequencing network, you're going to give up all control, and again, control is probably not the perfect word for what I wanna describe here, but let's continue. They wanna give up control, They sorry, they must give up control of their sequencer to participate in the shared sequencing network, right? Imagine you're offering me a bunch of interoperability benefits as long as I hand away my sequencer to your shared sequencing network. You're then going to say, hey, don't worry about any of the performance. Don't worry about any of the MEV collection. Don't worry about the censorship. Don't worry about X, Y, Z. All of the stuff we talked about that is in the power of a sequencer. That is very crucial stuff for the L2 to make sure that is performing in a way they want, right? Control is not the right word. I, I'm not, <laughs> not sure what the word is here, but the word sovereignty, it doesn't make much sense to me, but sovereignty, they want sovereignty of their chain. They don't wanna hand away control and basically say, well, it's up to you now to make sure my L2 operates in the way that I want it to. It maintains strong performance. It maintains uh, you know, a good reputation. It's doing the right things. I can no longer even optimize the software. I can no longer optimize the hardware that it's running on. I'm just gonna give away this control of such a crucial part of my L2 to this other shared sequencing network. And the trade-off that I get for that is, well, my L2 chain has more uh, interoperability between other L2s that are participating in this same shared sequencing network. So it's a pretty big sacrifice, at least to me, that's, that's the way that I view the kind of pros and cons of shared sequencing is, well, yes, you do get interoperability benefits, but you're essentially handing away a very crucial part of your L2's uh, system away to a third party. And this also limits your ability as an L2 to do things like, well, you can no longer run a centralized sequencer even if you wanted to, because, well, <laughs> you've opted in for a shared sequencing network that is by uh, default a uh, decentralized sequencing network. You can no longer have control over the MEV collection. You can no longer, and this, this doesn't mean, well, that's a good thing for chains, right? They can't keep taking away my money. That's not what I'm trying to say. It's like, 
well, what if in a perfect world, this, this L2 chain is operating with full integrity. They don't want to do anything negative. They're only trying to benefit the users, right? They still have to give away control. And then you're trusting the shared sequencing network to do the right thing. And you no longer have the power to enforce that the right thing is being done. That's kind of what I'm trying to say is even if I wanted to do the right thing as an L2 developer, by opting into a shared sequencer, I can't enforce that that is going to be done because I'm giving away the capability to do so to someone else. That's probably the accurate way to describe what uh, I'm trying to get across here, right? When I read these sentences out loud, it's like, well, you know, screw the L2s that are trying to screw over their users by taking the MEV, right? That's not what I'm trying to say. Yes, that is also true. If you, <laughs> you know, if you're an evil L2 developer and you wanted to say, ah, I'm just gonna, you know, charge way, way, way too much and, and collect all of this money for, for my users using my L2, that is also something you're going to give away, right? The freedom of choice is not there, regardless of if you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Uh, and of course that is up to debate, but the capability to do that is no longer in your hands it's in the hands of the shared sequencing network. So that's really what I wanted to get across as a downside here. So you can't really do anything to optimize or customize your sequencer if you're opting into the shared sequencing network. So shared sequences, therefore the pros and cons are, yes, it has decentralization because shared sequencing networks are decentralized networks and they have interoperability between any of these L2 chains that opt in to use the same shared sequencing network. So let's say uh, Optimism and Arbitrum opt in to use the Espresso shared sequencer network. Those would have interoperability between each other and as well as any of the other L2 chains that opt into that same shared sequencer. So that would enable new use cases, which are great for users and also maintains decentralization, which is great, but it's not as performant. And importantly, as an L2 developer, you're losing the sovereignty of your chain. And I've just added a little note here. The L2 developers are going to give up control of the sequencer away to that shared sequencing network. Sorry, I, I my head is covering that. Let's just quickly go back. <laughs> so what I wanted to say, I'm sorry if my head covers stuff in this video, I, I'm distracted at the middle of my screen, but that is what we were talking about under my head. Here. All right. So the final kind of part of this video I wanted to talk about is what got announced um, yesterday when I'm recording this for you, it'll probably be a couple of days ago, which is the Polygon Ag Layer. And this is short for aggregation layer. The Polygon Ag Layer enables the same atomic transactions and cross rollup interoperability as the shared sequencing networks that we just talked about. Importantly, without forcing the L2s to give away uh, sovereignty or control of their sequences. They can still choose to operate their own decentralized sequencer or choose to operate their own centralized sequencer. If they're Mr. Evil, they can take as many fees and, and collect MEV sensor people if they want. Most likely, most L2s are not going to do that. They want and they care about the people using their L2 chains. They want to make sure that the integrity of the chain is being maintained and they feel they have the power and the ability to do that with their own sequencer. They don't wanna give it away to a shared sequencer. So this is kind of the best of both worlds. You get the freedom to operate the sequencer how you want, whether that be centralized or decentralized, any customizations you want to that system, as well as the interoperability between any of the L2s that have opted in to use this aggregation layer. So let's talk about how this actually works now. And importantly, I put this slide here because I was a bit worried that people's reactions to this would be like, oh, this, this whole video is about Polygon, right? It was just a Polygon shill. So I wanted to importantly call out that any Alt L1 or Alt, sorry, any Alt L1 or L2 can opt in to participate in this ag layer system. It's not just Polygon chains. Uh, I know we've talked about Polygon a lot on this channel as I am currently the uh, developer relations in the developer relations team at Polygon Labs. So yes, this is built by uh, the Polygon Labs team as the uh, Polygon ag layer, but this is not just unique to Polygon CDK chains. 
All right, so why Aglia? So we're gonna talk about why before we talk about what and how it works, and then we'll move into the roadmap because not all of the things that I'm about to talk about are available today. This is going to be kind of a phased uh, release over 2024. So we'll review the roadmap and then we'll close out the video. So L2 developers, I wanted to talk about first, we've got L2 developers, app developers, and the end users here. So the L2 developers are obviously the uh, developers of the L2 chains. They're faced with this kind of issue right off the bat where, well, if I launch my chain, I'm gonna have to somehow try and incentivize people to come over to my chain, provide liquidity, build experiences, uh, build smart contracts, build decentralized applications, right? I need to kind of bootstrap the entire ecosystem where there's community and there's liquidity in order to add value to a lot of these experiences, right? A lot of applications in Web3 aren't really useful unless there is liquidity available to uh, actually tap into, right? And L2 developers, imagine you're today, you're about to launch a brand new L2. You're gonna have zero liquidity. You're gonna have zero users. What if you could tap into all of the other chains that are kind of opted in already to the aggregation layer? Right? What if you could tap into the community of Polygon POS, which has you know billions of dollars stored on it and millions of users that are using the chain, right? And a lot of experiences from big Web3 bands uh, already available, right? You can kind of tap into existing chains, existing communities, and importantly, existing liquidity by allowing the tokens to be transferred in a cross-chain uh, manner. So that is L2 developers. Why would I want to use this? As an app developer, why would you wanna use this? It's kind of the same thing, right? As an app developer, right at the beginning of your development process, you're likely going to make a decision. What chain am I gonna deploy my smart contracts to? Is it Ethereum? Is it Polygon? Is it um, Scroll? What communities do I wanna access? Where do I think my application is going to be most successful? Yes, there are ways to do, you know, you can deploy the same smart contract to multiple applications, but it's gonna be fragmented and siloed communities across multiple different chains, right? Usually you see an application picks one chain, smart contracts is, exist there, and then the community that they tap into is the community of that chain. For app developers, probably you wanna access the biggest uh, community that you can, right? You want to access, let's say you're building a social application, right? You want to access the people over on Arbitrum. You want to access the people over on Optimism, or you want to access all of the Polygon CDK chains, for example. You want to access the community on X1, which we have a video about on my channel. You want to access any of these you know, various CDK chains that are being onboarded. There's too many, I can even uh, name one off the top of my head. All of these communities rather than one because probably for app developers, they want more users, right? So what if you could tap into these existing application uh, users on various different chains? And then for end users, it's kind of the reverse of that. It's like, well, it would be so much better if I didn't have to care about what chain I was on. I could just submit these bundles of transactions that say, do this on this chain, do this on this chain, and I can be guaranteed that those are going to go through or they're going to fail. And, and we don't end up in this weird state where some of them went through and some of them failed. And this for end users can enable things like, for example, if you earned a token on a mutable ZK EVM, you were playing some game over there, you earn some tokens, you want to transfer those to the Polygon ZK AVM or the Polygon ZK POS, which is uh, again on my channel. If you want to do that cross-chain transfer, this is going to be a new and awesome experience for you. All right, so how does this actually work? So I've kind of broken it down into six dot points here. It is a little complex. So the way that it works is essentially each chain's sequencer executes the transactions as usual, right? So those sequences, as we talked about, the benefit to this is that you maintain your sovereignty. You get to choose the way that your sequencer behaves. Is it a centralized system? Is it a decentralized system? What kind of um, MEV collection are you implementing, right? These different um, rules that you have the control to actually implement because you still own your central, uh, your sequencer, sorry. So imagine uh, we haven't really changed anything from how L2s operate today. The sequences execute the transactions as usual. So that's the first role that we talked about of the sequencer. Then this is where it changes a little bit. So each chain's sequencer generates a zero knowledge proof, ZK proof 
of its updated state. So it executes a bunch of transactions, it comes up with an updated state, and it generates a zero knowledge reflective of that, okay? Once it's done that, it's going to send that zero knowledge proof back to the ag layer rather than Ethereum, okay? So as we kind of talked about, the sequence's role typically is to send transaction data back to Ethereum. And it's expensive to do that, right? So instead of that, imagine instead of chains coming from um, L2 back to Ethereum, there's a layer on top of Ethereum, which is the ag layer. So chains, instead of submitting directly to Ethereum, they will instead submit to this middle layer, which is the ag layer, rather than going straight down to Ethereum. So here's where the kind of name ag layer uh, starts to become pretty self-explanatory. The ag layer aggregates, which is the ag part, all of the proofs that it receives from however many chains, right? You could have um, the OKX X1 chain uh, submitting zero knowledge proof back down to the ag layer. You could have Polygon ZK AVM chain. You could have however many chains that are opting into this ag layer. They're all sending this proof of the updated state down to the ag layer. It essentially aggregates all of those proofs and generates a single aggregated zero knowledge proof. So what that means is it generates a zero knowledge proof that essentially proves all of the other proofs that it received. So now we have a single zero knowledge proof that proves these uh, state changes from multiple different L2 chains. And the final step is a single proof from the ag layer, the aggregated proof is then sent to Ethereum. So rather than sending proof and proof and proof and proof and proof and proof and proof from however many chains at the L2 level directly to Ethereum, which by the way is a pretty expensive process, that goes through the ag layer and produces a single zero knowledge proof that reflects all of the uh, proofs that were submitted from however many chains. That single aggregated zero knowledge proof goes to Ethereum to represent all of the chains um, state updates are valid. Okay, so the follow-up question that I had to this is, how is this even possible? Aren't zero knowledge proofs really slow to generate? And the answer is yes, right? Currently in the Polygon ZKBM, the process to generate zero knowledge proofs that reflect the validity of batches of transactions takes around 30 to 60 minutes, right? So that's a pretty long process. So what a later release of the ag layer is going to introduce is these things called optimistic confirmations. And this essentially means a chain can send a batch of transactions without first generating a zero knowledge proof that reflects that that batch is actually uh, valid. It's going to send that batch of transactions to the ag layer without proving it, right? So you could, in theory, send a bunch of garbage transactions to the ag layer. And then any transactions from other chains that depend on transactions within that batch from chain A. So let's say a transaction on chain B depends on what's happening on a transaction on chain A. In this optimistic confirmation system, that is basically going to be optimistically approved without any zero knowledge proofs to back up those claims. So what I mean by that is essentially, let's say chain A sends down a batch of transactions, right? And then chain B, a user is saying, I wanna do this transaction, but it depends on what happened on this other chain. And that transaction is included in the batch that got sent, but not proved. It's going to say, well, I'm going to optimistically say, I trust what's in the batch that is not proven. That transaction is now kind of allowed to happen regardless of the fact that it hasn't been proven yet. And that cross chain transaction is going to happen optimistically. Later, let's say the proof from chain A gets generated, right? Now you've got the backup to the claim. Well, I submitted a batch of transactions. The user who relied on the transaction in the batch that I submitted is happy now, right? I've provided the proof. All of this is going to settle back down on Ethereum with these zero knowledge proofs that back up all of these claims. And I optimistically achieved the cross chain transaction in a couple of seconds because none of these proofs were actually generated at that point in time. Right? There was nothing to ensure the validity of those transactions were actually correct. I just optimistically was able to do that. 
But what if they don't post a zero knowledge proof or they post as an invalid zero knowledge proof, right? What if they tried to send a batch of transactions that were invalid to the ag layer? So this might be something like chain A sequencer is trying to perform some kind of attack where they're maybe stealing users' funds or something like that. They submitted a bunch of transactions that are false, right? They didn't actually occur. They send those down to the ag layer and then some innocent person on a different chain depends on what happened in that batch of transactions, right? It's important for them to first be able to do this cross-chain interoperability in you know, a matter of seconds rather than 30 to 60 minutes. So this optimistic confirmation comes through and it says, hey, I've got this unproven batch. You can rely on this information and if it's not correct, we'll fix it up later. If the chain is acting incorrectly, right? It's, it's produced an invalid batch or it just never produces a proof to back up those claims at all, right? Chain B is therefore going to roll back, right? Because chain A submitted a bunch of transactions that are not valid and chain B updated its state because it depended on however many transactions were in chain A's batches, but the batches that it depended on were actually not valid. So it's forced to roll back to a state and chain A gets slashed for this behavior, right? So it's a kind of similar incentive mechanism for Ethereum, where if you don't produce the right results as a proof of stake validator, you're going to get slashed, basically lose your money for doing the wrong thing or trying to attack the network. So in future releases of this ag layer, there's going to introduce this concept of optimistic confirmations. And I'll probably release a full separate video on how this works. It's probably not enough time to kind of skim over this in just a couple of minutes here. But optimistic confirmations, the TLDR is, what if we could kind of optimistically say these cross-chain interactions are going to be enabled in a couple of seconds rather than having to wait that kind of huge time period for those proofs, right? So in terms of how this is going to roll out, I'm actually just going to show you the official blog post from Polygon itself. So the production ready ag layer V1 containing the unified bridge is coming in February. The common proof aggregator, I believe is coming in April this year. And then the other features that we talked about, such as the uh, optimistic confirmations of these cross-chain transactions is going to come out later in 2024. So that is my ultimate guide to layer two blockchains sequences and what is being built to add the interoperability between these layer two blockchains. If you enjoyed this kind of content, a lot of research and kind of preparation does go into it. I would appreciate if you like the video and subscribe to the channel. If you wanna see more Web3 content like this, check out my other videos on my channel if you're interested in other aspects of all things in Web3 and especially Polygon in particular. Appreciate your watching and I hope to see you in the next one.